post amazing fam, let's waste no time and dive right into part 3 of the top 10 concerning UFO evidence the Pentagon is hiding from us. Starting off at our number 10 spot we have the Shag Harbor incident. This UFO encounter is often referred to as Canada's Roswell, so I was shocked that I hadn't heard of it before. Basically this incident took place on October 4th, 1967 when an unknown object crashed into the water near Shag Harbor, which is a tiny town in Nova Scotia. There were at least 11 people who witnessed this object object as it crashed and many people claimed to have heard a whistling sound followed by a loud bang when the crash took place. The witnesses that claimed to have seen the UFO were all doing a bunch of different things at the time. One couple was just sitting on their porch, but the two witnesses that really get me are a flight pilot and a ship captain. On Air Canada Flight 305, First Officer Robert Ralph pointed out to Captain Pierre Charbonneau that there was something strange out the left side of the aircraft. They reported an object tracking along on a parallel course a few miles away and described it as brilliantly lit, rectangular object with a string of smaller lights trailing the object. Shortly after they first noticed it, there was a large but silent explosion near the unknown object, and then two minutes later there was a second explosion, but this one faded to a blue cloud. As for the ship captain, Captain Leo Howard Mercy saw four blips on his DECA radar that were totally stationary. This led to him looking up to the sky, and this is when he saw four bright objects sitting in a rectangular formation about 28 kilometers from the vessel's window. He wasn't the only one who saw it on board. The entire crew of nearly 20 fishermen stood on deck and watched. A man named Lori Wickens was another one of the witnesses and he and some friends ended up calling the RCMP, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, because they saw a huge object floating in the Atlantic Ocean about a thousand feet offshore. This is all super weird and not only the RCMP but also the Royal Canadian Navy and the Royal Canadian Air Force became involved in investigations, but nothing was ever recovered or found. But it also revealed that all commercial, private, and military aircrafts along the eastern seaboard were accounted for. So, what could have all these witnesses seen? Since they have never officially identified what it was, in the official Government of Canada documents it is listed as a UFO. In our number 9 spot today we have the Lake and Heath Bentwaters incident. If you flash back to the first installment of this series, in part 1 I spoke about the Rendlesham Forest incident, and this one is kind of similar to that one which only adds to its bizarre nature. In August of 1956, radio operators at Royal Air Force Bentwaters began to notice something strange on the radar. Basically, there was some sort of aircraft, and whatever it was, it was traveling at speeds of over a thousand miles per hour. Of course, since this was near an Air Force base, they immediately sent training aircrafts up to intercept and investigate, but at that point, it found nothing. Shortly after this, a ton of Air Force personnel on the ground began to see a bunch of bright lights in the sky darting around quickly, and they were also being picked up on the radar again, this time traveling at even higher speeds, closer to 2,000 miles per hour. This is when they sent up two Venom interceptors and directed them towards the radar target that was now over Lakenheath. The pilot of the first Venom did achieve contact, but the UFO was quick to outmaneuver him and ended up behind him. The UFO actually chased this pilot for about 10 minutes, despite the pilot doing really aggressive, evasive tactics. The pilot was described as, quote, getting worried, excited, and also pretty scared during this encounter. In the end, they were forced to return to base and the target remained on their radar screens for a short while, but before it disappeared. The Condon Committee looked into this case and made quite an unusual conclusion. They normally conclude that UFO sightings are due to some natural phenomena or aircraft, but in this incident they wrote, quote, In conclusion, although conventional or natural explanations certainly cannot be ruled out, the probability of such seems low in this case, and the probability that at least one genuine UFO was involved appears to be fairly high. In our number 8 spot today we have the Valensoul incident. Ok, I get it. Everywhere's got to have their Roswell incident, and this one is said to be France's. This sighting was made by a man named Maurice Mass, who was a French farmer, and it took place in July of 1965. One day before starting work while outside smoking, Maurice witnessed an object coming out of the sky and landing in his lavender field about 200 feet away from where he was. He was of course frustrated at someone landing in his field, and figured that it was likely a helicopter that made some sort of unauthorized landing, but as he got closer, things took a turn 
return. He realized this was no helicopter and instead was some sort of oval shaped structure that was standing on four legs. In front of the strange craft were two figures just under four feet tall. He explained that they were making sort of grumbling sounds and included a brief description of these creatures before explaining that one of them took out a pencil like device and pointed it at him which left him completely stuck in his tracks just frozen in time. As he was stuck there the creatures got back in their craft and took off and after about 20 minutes he finally regained his ability to move. Here's the thing. To me, this sounds like a fantastical story, but there was some kind of physical evidence left behind that I, and many others, can't quite figure out an explanation to. Basically, the craft did end up leaving a mark. There was a hole and a lot of moisture left over from where the craft was. Like I mentioned, this was in the middle of a lavender field. Soon after, this area became really hard, almost like concrete, and definitely not like the soil everywhere else in the field, and all of the plants around this area started to die. Analysis of the soil revealed that there was a higher amount of calcium in the soil at the landing site than there was anywhere else in the lavender field. This definitely shows that there was some kind of unusual event. Could Maurice be telling the truth? In our number 7 spot today we have the Project Blue Book sighting. Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Richard French was once tasked with being an investigator for Project Blue Book, which was the name used to describe a study of UFOs conducted by the United States Air Force from March of 1952 to December 7th. 17th, 1969, when the project was terminated. While his job was meant to be to investigate and essentially debunk UFO sightings, later in life he took to Congress to stand up to explain his own UFO encounter that he was never able to explain away. The moment that truly stuck with him all of these years was back in 1952 when he set off to Newfoundland after there were reports of a UFO that had crashed off the coast of St. John's. As he arrived to the scene, there were at least a hundred people who all stood and stared into the water, and as he was able to follow their gaze and see what they were looking at, he couldn't believe his eyes. He recalled the water being quite clear, and under it you could see two circular crafts, each one approximately 18 feet in diameter. He said that they were both floating just below the surface of the water, no more than 20 feet from shore, and not only this, but he could also see two beings with the crafts. He said, quote, the first thing I saw was the UFOs, and it was apparent to me that they were doing something to the craft, and I couldn't really tell what because they were on the bottom side of it and not visible to me, except when they would occasionally get over to the side where I could see them. He claims he watched on as the beings worked on the craft until one of them raised out of the water and disappeared, but not before accelerating to speeds in the neighborhood of 2,500 to 3,000 miles an hour. In our number 6 spot today we have the classified report. We aren't even a full month into 2023, but already there are some crazy announcements including one regarding a report that was delivered to Congress from the director of national intelligence. Basically, since August of last year, there has been a total of 510 unidentified aerial phenomena observed in protected airspace or near sensitive facilities. According to the report, 26 of them were described as drones, 163 were labeled as balloons or balloon like entities, and 6 were described as clutter, whatever that means. This is all fine and well, but the concern sets in when we consider that this leaves 171 sightings unaccounted for. For, some of which, quote, appear to have demonstrated unusual flight characteristics or performance capabilities. It's also important to note that the majority of these sightings are coming directly from Navy and Air Force pilots. Here's the thing, what we as the public know is only a 12 page declassified summary of the actual, real, secret report that was delivered to Congress. Only time will tell if we ever find out what the rest of the report includes or what will happen with the further investigation into the 170 71 sightings, but hopefully if answers do arise, one day we'll find out. In our number 5 spot today we have the Westall Incident. Taking it back to 1966, we have the largest mass UFO sighting in Australia that, at the time, was largely ignored. This incident took place when over 300 students and staff members of a school in Melbourne all witnessed multiple UFOs silently flying through the air before they landed in a nearby field. While there's been a ton of speculation about this incident in the many years it's been, one witness account stands out among the rest and that is the account made by the scientists 
science teacher from the school, Andrew Greenwood. He was alerted to the UFO event by a hysterical student, and when he went outside to see for himself, everything changed. Previously a skeptic of UFO stories, Andrew's mind was abruptly changed when he saw, as he described it, a round silver object about the size of a car with a metal rod sticking up in the air. He went on to explain that suddenly five planes came and surrounded the object, all while more people were gathering to watch. He called what happened next the most amazing flying he had ever seen, explaining that quote, every time they got too close to the object, it would slowly accelerate, then rapidly accelerate, and then move away from them and stop. They would take off after it again and the same thing would happen. This went on for about 20 minutes before the mysterious object just vanished. As weird as this all was, what was almost weirder was what happened next. Firstly, the headmaster of the school is said to have tried to put a stop to anyone talking about the incident at all, threatening severe punishment to any student or staff who was caught speaking about it. And when the Royal Australian Air Force contacted him, he refused to talk to them about it at all. There have also been stories of witnesses getting visits from people warning them not to speak of the incident. Andrew explained, quote, when he asked the physical education teacher to describe what she had seen herself so that he could compare it with his own observation, she just wouldn't say anything. Another witness who did talk to Andrew and described what she had seen in great detail, just 30 minutes later refused to speak to him and wouldn't say a word. Was this because of the threats from the headmaster? Or was something else going on here? This is definitely a strange UFO story that leaves behind a lot of questions. In our number four spot today, we have flight 1628. Back on November 17th, 1986, Japan Airlines cargo flight 1628 was flying from Paris to an airport near Tokyo when they had a very strange UFO encounter. On the part of the flight where they were over Alaska around 1711, the crew witnessed two unidentified objects to the left of their craft. The two objects rose up quite quickly to meet the craft and continued to fly alongside it. Each object had two rectangular things that are said to have appeared to be some sort of glowing nozzles or thrusters, but the crew on the plane couldn't see much else. They weren't able to see if there was anyone or anything inside. The closer these objects came to the plane, the more light was let inside, so much so that at the closest points, the plane's cabin was totally lit up, and the captain even said he could feel heat from the lights on his face. After this, the two objects left, but this was not the end because a third much larger disc-shaped object showed up and started following the plane. In the end, the plane needed to make an emergency landing in Anchorage, Alaska, because this third craft was seriously large and incredibly frightening, and they just needed to figure out what was going on here. The plane landed successfully, and investigations were conducted, but to this day, no one is exactly sure what the men on board saw, but the entire crew witnessed the exact same thing. In our number three spot today, we have the Mount Rainier incident. This incident took place when Kenneth Arnold was en route from Chehalis, Washington to Yakima, Washington on June 24, 1947. Kenneth was traveling in a privately owned plane when he suddenly saw a bright flash on his wing. He looked around and this is when he saw a chain of nine unidentified flying objects approaching Mount Rainier. He explained that he quote, could see their outline quite plainly against the snow as they approached the mountain. He continued on saying, quote, they flew very close to the mountain tops, directly south to southeast down the hogs back of the range, flying like geese in a diagonal chain-like line, as if they were linked together. From here, he explained that, quote, they were approximately 20 or 25 miles away, and I couldn't see a tail on them. I watched for about three minutes, a chain of saucer-like things at least five miles long, swerving in and out of high mountain peaks. They were flat like a pie pan, and so shiny they reflected the sun like a mirror. He also told investigators that he had never seen anything travel that fast in his life. Unfortunately, Kenneth's story was met with disbelief and a bit of ridicule, this made Kenneth quite resentful, but he said, quote, They can call me Einstein, Flash Gordon, or just a screwball, but I am absolutely certain of what I saw. He added that if he ever again saw a phenomena in the sky, even if it were a 10-story building flying through the air, he would not say a word about it. In our number two spot today, we have the Broadhaven UFO sighting. This UFO sighting took place back in 1977, and it all started when an entire class of children all claimed to see some sort of object flying through the sky. The children rightfully were confused and excited over what they have seen, but of course the teachers and adults around them believed it was just their wild imaginations making things up. This is when they decided to split all of the children up and have them draw whatever it is that they saw. While there of course were variations in all of the children's drawings, they all basically drew the exact same thing, which begs the question, did they really all see this thing? The children
children weren't the only ones who saw it either. Shortly after their sighting, other local residents began to explain that they had seen something strange flying through the air, including one hotel owner. One of the things that really gets people about this case and these sightings in particular is that all of these people claim to have seen something at that time, and even though it's been almost half a century, not a single one of them has ever said it was a hoax or that they were lying about what they saw. They all have the same story they did the day it happened. Finally, in our number one spot today, we have Betty and Barney Hill. The Betty and Barney Hill case is definitely one of the most famous UFO abduction stories ever told, and it absolutely has some pretty compelling components. Basically, the story goes that the two were driving on a road in New Hampshire one night on the way home from a trip the pair had taken. Before they got in the car on their way home, they were at a diner and figured that if they really pushed through, they could beat the wind and rains from an approaching hurricane. It was 10 p.m. when they left the diner, and they figured by around 2 a.m., 3 a.m. latest, they'd arrive home. As they drove out of nowhere, a bright light started to follow them. Suddenly, they arrived home, and it's somehow daylight now. Their clothes are dirty and ripped, and their watches had stopped working. This is all jarring enough, but neither Betty nor Barney could figure out what had happened. They were both missing time. Later, during a session with a psychiatrist, they were able to recall being touched by aliens during their abduction. Project Blue Book would come to investigate their claims, and while people remain skeptical, no one has ever been able to debunk their story. This officially went on to become the first ever widely publicized abduction story, and to this day, people still debate what really happened to the Hills. All right, guys, that has been our list for today. Thanks so much for checking it out. I've been your host today, Olivia Kozlowski, and I'll see you again soon. Bye.